it gives me great pleasure to now introduce our next distinguished lecturer, Yap Bonnier. In a few words, this is the Gerald Marks lecture. Well, Dr. Marks is sitting in the second row of our audience today, and I love seeing him every year, and the contributions that he has made to our organization are phenomenal. He is a visionary in endoscopy and was at a very early stage. He played a pivotal role in the founding of our organization and was our first SAGES president in 1981. Well, 36 years later, we get to visit with Dr. Marks. We see him as a vibrant part of our SAGES family that it is wonderful to see him at our meetings, exchange ideas, and to see him every time as an ambassador of our organization to so many people that he has met along his journey. Thank you, Dr. Marks. Well, Yap Bonnier is an esteemed expert in surgery in many ways. He did his medical training and residency and then stayed on a surgical staff at the Erasmus University Medical Center in Rotterdam. He was awarded the chair of the clinical, uh, chair in the endoscopic surgery. And then he moved on to be chairman of the Department of Surgery at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada. In 2009, he moved back to the Netherlands and became chairman of the Department of Surgery at the Free University Medical Center in Amsterdam. And he especially likes to do endocrine surgery and minimally invasive surgery. Well, I had the great pleasure to get to know Yop a bit over our mutual work on, on our journal, Surgical Endoscopy, as we both served on the joint uh, panel for uh, SAGES and EAES, our European sister society, for our common journal. Well, I was not aware, however, of the phenomenal amount of work Yop was doing in surgical education until I had the pleasure of hearing a talk that he gave in January of last year at the American Board of Surgery Retreat. He has played a major role in competency-based training in his country, the Netherlands, and in particular, there are methods for training that he has helped orchestrate that may serve as a very important model for innovation of our methodologies here in the United States and elsewhere. We are thrilled that Dr. Bonnier is our 2017 Gerald Marks Lecturer. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Danny. Uh, Danny Scott, Dr. Jared Marks, members of SAGES, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to be the presenter of the two, SAGES 2017 Dr. Jared Marks Lecture. It's a fantastic opportunity, I would say. Dr. Marks, we met the first time in 1995 in Orlando. And I was just two years out of surgical residency, and I didn't expect the founder of SAGES to come up to a young surgeon from the Netherlands, but you did. And you welcomed me to the SAGES family. And you were very kind, and you were interested in me. And it has been a great privilege and a great pleasure to be a member of the SAGES family for over 22 years. You also came to Amsterdam last year in June for the uh, AAS meeting. And you seem to be unaffected by the travel. I think you're immune to jet lag. <laughs> and we were all inspired by your energy and your passion for our great profession. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the objectives of this uh, talk for today is to, are to share the experience with the, during the transition from time-based to competency-based residency in the Netherlands. And I share that experience on, the, on behalf of the entire Dutch surgical community, and in particular the Council of uh, Dutch Program Directors. Then I will attempt to answer the question whether competency-based surgical training is the solution. And then I have a few modest suggestions how we possibly could move forward. Well, after having served Her Majesty the Queen for two years in the Royal Dutch Navy, I started my residency in Rotterdam. It was six years residency. We, as almost all of you, I presume, worked 
80 to 100 hours a week. Weekend call started on a Friday morning, would end Monday evening, and we did many cases. And the number of cases was, as a matter of fact, the only quality metric that we had in those days for the outcome of our training. In the Netherlands, uh, it's, it's uh, marked on the OR list who's the primary surgeon. So the resident can be the primary surgeon. So we can keep good track of that. We also do qualify surgeries. We qualify them from category one to seven. One being, for instance, a perianal abscess and seven a Whipple. So why did we change? Why did we change from a time-based to competency-based surgical training? Well, the answer is very simple. It was all part of improving quality and safety in healthcare. And as you know, there are many uh, components to improving quality and safety. And a very important one of those is assuring that the healthcare professionals who are at the bedside of our patients are fit to perform. So we're talking about working hour restrictions. In 1993, at the end of my residency, the Dutch Medical Association passed a vote. A vote on whether we were going to adopt the European Working Hours Directive or not. A vote which would result in a reduction of the work week from 80 to 100 hours to 48 hours per week, including coal. All surgeons, to no surprise, were against. All other medical specialties voted in favor. We did appeal. We appealed to the Minister of Health, who is the highest power in healthcare in the Netherlands. And the Minister of Health said, well, what is your problem? Well, we said, we are very concerned that the residents will do, not do the same number of cases in this new system. And the Minister said, well, let's wait and see what happens. And is that your only quality outcome? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. So we were worried about the number, and we were also, of course, worried that uh, uh, second residencies, residency would start for the staff members. I was just just glad to get out, get out of the residency, and I could see uh, another one, a lifelong one, coming up. And what happens? Did the number of surgeries uh, drop for the residents? Not at all. It remained completely stable. And how is that possible? Well, when the residents are at the hospital, they perform surgeries or they go to clinic, and the other work is taken care of now by a new care model employing clinical associates, hospitalists, physician assistants, and nurse practitioners. And I would say that the quality of care on our floors has improved because the hospitalists are there nonstop. They have a focus on medication. Uh, the number of medication errors has dropped enormously. And they're not distracted by the OR or the emergency room. So I think it's a good model. So to you, it may sound like a nightmare, a 48-hour surgical work week, is it? Well, I figure it would be, but as a matter of fact, it is not at all. So what it means is that our residents uh, cannot be present in the hospital for, on average, more than 48 hours a week. Shifts should be no longer than 12 hours, and after a, a night shift, there's a full day of compensation. So do they only work 48 hours, our residents? Absolutely not. When they're at home, they're preparing surgeries, they're following patients, and this is one of the virtues of our electronic medical record, and they study online. So I think it's also, when we take a step back, uh, not so timely anymore to uh, define a work week by looking at the number of, of hours that employees spend physically at the workplace. It's like uh, denial of information and communication technology. We all work while we're at the meeting, we're working. So we should uh, redefine that. There is concern about uh, loss of information during handoffs. How has that been arranged in the hospitals in the Netherlands? Well, from Monday to Friday, we have two handoffs. And one is at 7.45 in the morning. And the residents who have been on call report on the admissions of the past night, on the surgeries performed, uh, the uh, surgical patients in the ICU, and the assignments of the day. So you could also call it a huddle. We get together with all uh, subspecialties, and then we go our own way. At the end of the day, at four o'clock, there is again um, there is again a huddle of all uh, people, and then we discuss the surgeries of that day, and we also discuss the indications of the surgeries for the next day. So it's not rare that the patient is taken off the list because we, as a group, 
don't feel it's an appropriate indication. So it's a kind of internal audit. On the weekend at eight o'clock, uh, all uh, surgeons who were on call come to the hospital for a handoff, and then there's a handoff between the residents at 10 p.m. Another important component of improving quality and safety is subspecialization. The advances of uh, knowledge and technology have gone too fast to remain a competent general surgeon across all subspecialties. So we no longer train this omnipotent uh, general surgeon. We train surgeons in subspecialties with a very strong general surgery base. Another component is the centralization of complex care. And in the Netherlands, we have defined annual minimal numbers of surgeries that should be performed per institution. So when a hospital would perform 12 Whipple procedures per year, that hospital will no longer be contracted by the insurance companies to provide pancreatic surgery. So what does it look like in these days, surgical training in the Netherlands? Well, it's all uh, uh, organized around the eight uh, universities. There are eight uh, academic uh, uh, surgical departments, with all with six or seven affiliated teaching hospitals. And these uh, training regions provide uh, the surgical residency. Residents uh, spend uh, typically two years at the university and four years at the teaching hospital. How did we move to this competency-based surgical residency? Well, we uh, were inspired, of course, by the excellent uh, competencies defined by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada in 1996. And this is, uh, these are the competencies that we have defined in the Netherlands. Patient care, communication, organization, professionalism, collaboration, knowledge, societal accountability, and leadership, a very important one. So when we look at our residency, I mentioned to you that we have a very strong base in general surgery. So the first four years are spent on general surgery. The first two years, residents will develop basic levels of competencies, and in uh, year three and four, higher levels of competencies throughout all differentiations. At the end of the fourth year, our residents choose a subspecialty, and then they will develop, hopefully, expert levels of competency in those, fifth, uh, in those last years of residency. So we had a lot of confidence in this uh, system, so we uh, abandoned the formal fellowship. That was not a good idea, because our residents, at least two-thirds of them, don't feel comfortable going into independent practice after conclusion of the uh, surgical residency. So we did away with the formal fellowship, but we still have the same number of fellows. So the system is certainly not perfect yet. So how do we assess competencies? Well, we have five different levels, for instance, for patient care, going from uh, sufficient knowledge to being able to transfer knowledge. What about surgical skills from A to E, A being assisting sufficiently and E being able to supervise and teach other residents. And this is uh, what uh, our digital portfolio looks like. So after a, a surgical procedure, you sit down with a resident behind a computer in the, one of the OR suites, and you go through all the steps uh, through of the OZs. And then after assigning a, a certain grade for each step, you de determine what kind of role the resident could take from here on. And here we've assigned uh, level D, which means that the resident can uh, perform surgery unsupervised. Some surgeons complain about the administrative burden of doing this. This goes very quickly. It's done in two minutes at, when you sit at the computer. And I always appreciate it because it's kind of debriefing. It's kind of time out after the case. And you get to talk about other stuff as well. So it's a good time for reflection together with your resident. The digital portfolio not only has OZs, it also has a structured assessment of communication, rounding and pre uh, presentations, progress interviews, 360 degrees uh, assessment, and yes, we are also uh, participating in the app site, so those results are there as well. So what do we expect of a PGY2? 
Well, a PGY2 should be able to do an appendectomy with limited supervision. Perianal abscess uh, should be done uh, independently and uh, closed fracture reduction with uh, limited supervision. And you may wonder why the fractures are there. Well, the Netherlands, together with Austria, are the last countries in the world, I believe, where general surgeons take care of all trauma. We take care of all the fractures. I got a pretty good dynamic hip screw in my hands, to be honest with you. So, the PGY4s, which level should they be? Should be able to do a uh, lap coli independently and a hip fracture, there it is again, as well. And they should be able to supervise uh, residents performing uh, inguinal hernia surgery. So, is competency based training, is it uh, truly the solution? Well, there's a lot of criticism out there, uh, again, about the administrative burden. And also, and I think that is very valid, that the sum of what we all do is far greater than just the individual competency. So how do we go about that? Well, we can bridge the gap between the competencies and practice by working with so-called EPAs, that has already been mentioned this morning, and trustable professional activities. Those untrustable uh, professional activities are a more holistic uh, approach to our workplace. They represent broad units of professional practice. And they integrate various competencies. And they have been very well described by two Dutchmen, which is a coincidence, I believe, Olle ten Kate and Verder Schelen, educational expert and a gynecologist from Amsterdam. So, um, which levels of entrustment are there? It goes from one to five, from no permission to act, to provide supervision to junior trainees. So very much in keeping with the levels of the OZs. So here is Olle ten Kate, and I would recommend uh, this manuscript to you. It's like a cookbook for how to uh, develop an uh, EPA. So has it been uh, strictly uh, determined, defined what the breadth is of EPA, EPA? No, it's up to you. It's up to you as, as uh, teachers of uh, your residents. And it can be as, as narrow as measuring and reporting blood pressure, which could be a good EPA for a medical student, or as broad as running a regular outpatient clinic, which would be, which would be an EPA for a senior resident. And these are the components of the EPA, domains of competence. Uh, the EPAs need to be assessed by at least two uh, faculty uh, members, and the entrustment level and expiration date are other aspects of the EPA. So how do you choose your EPAs? How do you validate them? Well, there are different ways of going about it, either expert meeting or a survey, Delphi procedure, or interviews with program directors. There is no wrong way, there is no right way. And we need to take care that the EPAs, that we can enter all the data in a, a very uh, easy way. So either a very good website or make an app for your mobile device. And we, as I told you, we are in transition in the Netherlands from competency-based to EPAs. And these are the 15 EPAs that we have defined so far for the first four years of surgical residency. And I was attending a, a session yesterday with John Hunter, where he told us about uh, the EPAs which have been defined by the American board, and they're almost identical. So that's a very good sign. Just one example of an uh, EPA for appendicitis. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite logical what's over there. It's a proper medical history, surgery at level D, so that the uh, resident should be able to perform an appendectomy without any supervision. Uh, should be proper, sufficient postoperative management. This is all stuff we already know, but we put it together in an EPA. So, is this a solution? Uh, we finish the EPAs and then uh, we're done? Perfect uh, training? Well, I don't think so. Because if we take a step back and uh, we look at the duration of surgical residency, in North America it takes 14 years to train a surgeon. In Europe it takes 14 years to train a surgeon. Then you go out and practice, you need, still need a fellowship, and it needs five or 10 years before you're an experienced surgeon. So we take 25 years to train a surgeon. We need to do something differently. And uh, uh, when we uh, are very critical of ourselves, we still have a master apprenticeship residency. And we have structured many aspects of the residency better, 
but the, the true basis has not really changed. So just some suggestions which could help. The first one is, uh, should we not dissect our surgical procedures better? Do we explain well what the steps are? If we go into the OR, we have all those steps exactly in our mind, but do we share those steps? And do we explain what the caveats are? Or do we keep it to ourselves? Well, when you look at aviation, these are the, the steps of landing a plane. And in aviation, it has been, been very well defined what those steps are. And then when those, the, those steps are assessed, it's also done in a very detailed fashion. As you all know, and has been discussed many times here already at the meeting, there's a new procedure for patients with low rectal cancer. Wonderfully developed by Antonio Lacy, a very good friend of mine, five years ago. Transanal total mesorectal excision. A trial has just been started, a color three trial, to randomize patients with low rectal cancer between the transanal TME and a laparoscopic TME. And the problem in a trial is always the quality assurance, making sure that those who participate in the trial are not in the learning curve anymore, because then the comparison will not lead to very helpful findings. So the University of Amsterdam has collaborated with the Imperial College in London to develop a tool to assess the quality of the surgery better. And this was done by working with 14 expert colorectal surgeons. We followed the Delphi process and we asked the, uh, the surgeons to dissect the surgical procedure. Subsequently, a full operation manual was developed and then Imperial helped us, and this is a group of Ara Darzi and George Hanna, to develop a competency assessment tool. And it looks like this. So, all the, all the steps of the surgical procedure have been defined, and then each step is scored. So this is a semi-objective analysis uh, assessment of the quality of a procedure. So when a hospital wants to join the Color 3 trial, then we request an unedited video and score this video using this competency assessment tool. But we could also use this tool during our residency to evaluate how well our residents are, are doing. And we could also use it after residency to make sure that the medical specialist is still competent to perform a procedure. So this may help our thinking about how to explain better how to do a surgical procedure well. One training model is uh, working on the cadaveric human tissue. The, uh, the bodies preserved with formaldehyde uh, don't lend themselves very well for surgical procedures. So we had to work with fresh frozen tissue. Fresh frozen tissue is only suitable for training for two, maybe three days, but no longer. And 10 years ago, a new technique has been developed for fresh grade preservation of human tissue. And this technique uses a solution for embalmment with uh, less formaldehyde than the traditional method. And this shows you uh, a transanal TME. One is performed on a human body, a human cadaver, preserved according to the fresh grade technique, and the other one is in live surgery in a patient. And I hope you can appreciate in the, uh, in the fresh grade tissue uh, that the tissues, uh, the color is, uh, is like in live surgery. And also the, the tissue planes are almost identical. So I, I believe that this, uh, this will help us to, uh, to train our residents better because the best training model, of course, is, is the human body. And this uh, fresh grade uh, technique uh, leaves uh, the tissue soft for three to six months, which is a major advantage. What about the digital learning environment? We all talk about it, but have we standardized it? Uh, do we share it? I think we still have a long way to go. And so one of the uh, techniques that we can use is the new, uh, the modern uh, camera technology. And here you see one example of multiple view recording. We have a GoPro to film the, the procedure. We use an uh, iPhone to film the procedure. And so we have an internal image. So the learner can choose his or her 
interested area. So this provides a more complete picture of the whole uh, surgical procedure. And this is an adrenalectomy on the left side for a VO approach through the uh, retroperitoneal route, by the way. Jochen Bretsneider, ENT surgeon in, uh, in uh, Amsterdam, is uh, the leader of our e-learning uh, environment, and he has developed many iBooks and podcasts, and those are all accessible on iTunes U, U for free. So these uh, e-books with uh, dynamic uh, opportunities uh, will be a great aid, uh, I believe, in uh, training our residents. And here's another one, of course, of the larynx. And I like it when the, this is the larynx after a thyroidectomy, a good focal cord function. Uh, so the, again, that's another example of how we can uh, do more with e-learning. What about uh, simulation? What's new in simulation? Well, the box is certainly not new in simulation. The box is only 25 years uh, old. So why did I put that picture in there? Well, this picture was taken uh, during a visit of a delegation of the American Board of Surgery. And look at them. The leadership of the American Board of Surgery, John Hunter, John Bellinger, and Frank Lewis, how captivated they are. After all those years, uh, after thousands and thousands of cases, they still love to work on the box. So it's a very valid model. What about virtual reality simulation? Well, I think there are two flaws to uh, VR simulators. And one is that the, the graphics are not very good and there's no haptic feedback. And when a surgeon is just flapping the instruments up in the air, there's no, f no touch to it, it's not very interesting to train. So here are two gallbladders. Which one is the real one? You probably can tell. So the one on your, on your right is the, is the simulated one, and on the left is a live one. I believe that the image on the right comes close to uh, live surgery. And what's done, over, uh, done well over there are the reflections. And Danny Scott also just spoke about the reflection. How difficult is it to paint the glass? And uh, we need a super image for a helpful virtual reality simulation trainer. And then the haptic feedback. Well, the haptic feedback is not very good. Until one year ago, I got to know Moog. And Moog was previously Fokker. It was only 20 minutes away from the university in Amsterdam. I've never been there. They have developed a cataract surgery simulator. And I've tried the simulator, and when you cut through the cornea, there is no anatomic landmark, so it's strictly by feel. And the touch is absolutely superb. How have they done this? Well, Moog Fokker has developed many flight simulators. So their, their expertise is haptic feedback. And the haptic feedback is wonderful. Why did they build this cataract simulator? Well, Help Me See, a foundation set up by Jim Woods, a former pilot, uh, supported by Bill Gates, approached Moog. And Help Me See has provided cataract surgeries in almost a quarter million people in the low and middle income countries. That enormous work has been done by volunteers, by eye and surgeon teams of volunteers. And this is a fantastic, uh, fantastic accomplishment, of course. But at the same time, help me see, realize that this is not a sustainable solution. We need to train the community. So they asked uh, Moog to develop this cataract simulator and the expectation with this cataract simulator is that a healthcare professional without any surgical experience will be able to become a proficient cataract surgeon in three months, only three months. So 100 of those simulators have been built and will be shipped to the low, low and middle income countries. So will high quality virtual reality simulation, will that help us? Will that help us to provide better care to those five billion people across the world who do not have access to basic surgical care? It's important to realize that the burden, the burden of surgically treatable conditions in the world is greater than that of tuberculosis 
AIDS and malaria together. The top five procedures are the most frequently performed surgical procedure, the cesarean section for obstructive delivery. Other procedures in the top five are appendectomy, inguinal hernia, acute abdomen, open fracture. So we're talking about five, five EPAs. That doesn't sound, seem like a daunting task. So if we describe those five EPAs very well and unravel our surgical minds, map out what we're doing, explain to the learners what our cues are in clinical decision taking, and develop with other industries, develop together high quality virtual reality simulators. I believe that we can build a new way of learning, a new way of learning, a curriculum that will allow healthcare professionals, medics, nurses, to become a basic surgeon. In how long? I think it can be done within a year. It should not take 25 years. So by building on the competencies, all the lessons we have learned, I think we can move forward. So in closing, Dr. Scott, Dr. Marx, ladies and gentlemen, I firmly believe that SAGES and the EAS are very well positioned, given their long-time friendship and their great focus on innovation, on technology, that we are in a very good position to form a strong coalition a coalition which can explore and develop a new way of learning. A new way of learning that will hopefully make a difference in the lives of our fellow global citizens. I thank you very much. I congratulate Dr. Bonnier on an outstanding address. I think we have a lot to learn from him. We look forward to our partnerships with his upcoming presidential leadership role in years to come with EAES. I think we have a, a great opportunity to strengthen our bonds and to work together. Um, I will present a plaque to Yop uh, on behalf of this March lectureship. <laughs> it's not upside down.